Um, we're part of a big network of churches, um, all related to Woodlands, the Woodlands group of churches. And the churches all began with one man praying on the streets of Sea Mills a long, long time ago. How many years ago was it, Rob? Would you help me? Is it 35? Just over that. Yeah. Just over 35 years ago. So Rob is going to come and speak to us now, and I'm just going to pray for you. Yeah, Heavenly Father, you delight to show us mercy. And Lord, I thank you for Rob, and I thank you for his message this evening. Father God, would you speak through him? Lord, anoint and fill. And Lord, would you prepare our hearts to receive your word? Lord, show us your mercy, show us your love, show us your goodness, and bless us, Lord, through this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Great to be here at Metro. And um, <clears throat> Philip asked if I would uh, speak tonight, particularly in sharing something of vision for the Woodlands Group of Churches, of which uh, Woodlands Metro is part of that, and uh, to do that in a way of sharing um, as much as possible a personal testimony. <clears throat> so I'm going to do that by way of sharing the overall kind of vision that's there. And uh, we're going to take a scripture in a moment, which uh, not just yet, but I'll get Hannah to read in a moment. Um, so Life of Jesus, uh, our overall vision and mission statement for the Woodlands Group of Churches is to be continually reproducing the life of Jesus. Now often as church there may be different emphasis. Some folk feel, well, we want to focus on the Bible because the Bible is the base of authority for all life and practice. So they call themselves maybe a Bible chapel or some folks say, no, the gospel is really the central focus or we call ourselves, you know, four square gospel or maybe even worship and singing we call ourselves Hillsong or whatever it may be. But often we try to capture something of what those ingredients, but often those are functional things, whether it's biblical teaching or whether it's worship. Or with, but we wanted somehow to make at the center of it a about Jesus and about reproducing that life of Jesus. So us, the very core of our life as Woodlands Group of Churches is to be helping people to come to know Jesus. And what happens when somebody comes to know Jesus? What do you do then, Rob? You help them to become like Jesus. It's that whole life intentional discipleship in which from one degree of glory to another being changed in the likeness. So as somebody goes through that process of discipleship becomes like Jesus, what do they do then? Well, they, they then help somebody else come to know Jesus. And, and what do they then do? they help that person then to become like Jesus. And what you're doing is you're just continually reproducing the life of Jesus. And that's our kind of overall goal, our overall vision constantly to do that. You know, we've been in the season of Olympics over these past months. And uh, when you see some of these amazing athletes and the training that goes into it over years, up at dawn, as it were, until dusk, training and preparing, praying for that moment when the starting gun goes and their eyes are focused on the tape and they're pressing towards that goal and the whole energy and preparation have been towards that. Here's a scripture that helps us to see how important it is in our lives, personally, together as church, to have a sense of goal, a sense of vision, and these words are taken from Philippians chapter 3, and Hannah, I think, is going to read them to us. Is that right? Oh, they're coming up on there. So am I going to read them? Is that right? Yeah, all right, fine. Okay, well, here they are. It's just that Hannah's going to get them up on there for me. Thank you. Um, so this is Philippians chapter 3 and verse 14, and it's talking about pressing towards the goal. You know, when they're sprinting along and stretching out, as it were, and the, the word used here, because remember, the Olympics have their origins there in Greece, and this whole glimpse of athletics you have there in the New Testament, and they're, they're reaching out, straining towards, literally the word is straining towards the goal. I strain on towards the goal, towards the tape, to win the prize the gold as it were for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus what is that goal what's that ultimate purpose and aim here's the final verse of that chapter it goes on to say who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they would be like his glorious body, the likeness of Jesus. Father, we pray now that as we unfold these scriptures together, we share vision, as we illustrate from our own story, Lord, stir us tonight to catch something of your heart and vision for our lives, for our church together. In Jesus' lovely name, amen. It's so important in our lives that there's that sense of vision, not just that we start the year with it, but it's constantly there as inspiring us and stirring us. It, 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 Paul speaks here in Philippians 3 of a kind of a, an upward call, an upward pull of God. In our human nature, there's constantly a downward pull 
I remember taking our two children once when they were young and full of questions. We were out walking. It was an autumn time. The leaves were falling everywhere and twigs and branches. And we were up blaze walking. And uh, uh, Greg was always full of questions. Why, what, how? And so he's asking Dad, why do, why do all the leaves fall downwards? Uh, and all the branches, you know, and, uh, why don't they fly upwards? And explain, well, there's a, a law of gravity. And this law of gravity is about a downward pull of everything. If you let something go, it falls and literally it just drops and and there is a downward pull in human nature if you just let go in our human nature the tendency is towards selfishness and pride and vanity and greed there's a downward pull it's just human nature and as we explained this to Greg and he was watching a few more leaves fall and typically I could see his brain ticking he says but wait a minute dad he says everything's like it. everything just falls you know and he says dad he says the tree is growing upwards Ah, here's another principle. It's the principle of life. That where there is life, there's the potential to go against that downward pull. And so it is with us that there's a spiritual dimension to life. It's what the Bible calls its upward call, its upward pull in Christ Jesus. The power of the Holy Spirit at work within us, enabling us to go against the downward pull of human nature, our own selfish goals and ambitions and careers and aspirations, to sense a God-given vision. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Something that could shape the rest of your life. If you grasp this truth, it can shape it. Every day of your life, it's sensing that upward call, that sense that I'm committed to those purposes of God in my life. And so my own story and our own testimony is something of that story of reproducing the life of Jesus. I wasn't brought up in a Christian home. Uh, home for me was South Wales. I can hear a few cheers. In fact, some of you just asked if I've been to the south of France. I've just been to Costa del Wales and in Pembrokeshire where it's just the place to go for your holidays. It's, uh, so, in, in fact, um, we were four boys at home, very sporty and very competitive, and, uh, but we weren't a church-going family. In fact, the one occasion we did go to church because they had a football team, we got into a fight with a deacon's son, and that was the end of that story for a while. But then, uh, eventually, there was a friend who invited me along to some meetings, and uh, this friend was a Christian, I used to take the mick out of him, something awful, and, uh, but this meeting strangely wasn't on a Sunday, it was a midweek thing, I thought you only had church on a Sunday, but it was a whole week of meetings, he was asking me on a Monday to go, so uh, you know, he sort of challenged me, because I was always challenging him, always taking the mick out of him, something bad, and he said, but Rob, have you ever really seriously thought about the claims of Jesus? I said, oh, I know all those stories. See, for me, r- religion, it was like superstition. You know, the cross, which is the universal symbol of Christianity on the top of church spires or hanging around people. To me, that was a kind of lucky charm. Just like, you know, walking on a ladder was bad luck and seeing a black cat was good luck and wearing a cross around your neck was another sort of symbol of all that. It was all kind of religious superstition. He said, but Rob, have you ever really seriously considered the claims of Jesus? So he invited me to this meeting. I went along. Now, I knew nothing of this kind of stuff. And uh, here was a whole week of meetings. I didn't realize what was going on, where there was somebody really enthusiastically communicating the good news about Jesus. And, but as I listened, something stirred in me. For the first time in my life, I understood that Jesus, as the Son of God, loved me, Rob Scott Cook, and gave himself for me. And I was kind of blown away by it. It was also, it wasn't any kind of religious surroundings to it. It was just a real clarity of a simple truth. And, and by the end of that meeting, it was an opportunity to respond. And uh, I'd never prayed in my life. And so somebody just helped me to put into words a simple prayer. Oh, God, I'm sorry for all the wrong things I've done in my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me. Here tonight, I ask you to come into my life. And that night, something changed inside of me. I'd never prayed in my life before like that, and yet I knew something had happened. I won't tell you all the stories that followed. There was many of them, because it changed me completely, even my relationships and friendships and everything else around me. But from that night, I became a follower of Jesus. And for me now, it was pressing towards that goal. I can still remember a whole year went by. I told all my friends and got into lots of trouble and lots of hassle with different situations. I can remember a year later passing a church door in Grangetown, which is just uh, uh, outside from Panath. And uh, um, there was a, a summer evening and the door was open. And uh, I went inside to my absolute amazement. They had a kind of fishing pond or a pool of, of water in the middle of the church. And they were dipping people in it. I'd never seen this before. And somebody explained to me they were being baptized. And they said, every believer in Jesus gets baptized. I said, well, I'm a believer in Jesus. I've been... They said, well, if you're a Christian, you ought to get baptized because it's your way of telling me. I said, I've told everybody I can, I said. And, you know, I, I, I seemed a little point in doing it. They said, but, you know, this is, this is Jesus' command. And for a long time, for about a month or so, I really struggled with it. One day I just read those scriptures where it says, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And suddenly it clicked. I thought, yeah. 
I can still remember that night getting baptized, my next sort of step along that path, and each of these steps was significant shaping ones for me. It changed my life, my attitude to life, even to my attitude to studies. I was a real rebel, and, uh, but then I became much more conscientious, and eventually I, I came to Bristol University. By then, I'd already met a, a wonderful young lady called Pam, who now is my wife, and uh, we'd swap places. She came down to Panatha to do nursing, and I came up to Bristol to university here. And uh, I did my first degree here, and then went on to do postgraduate studies. And uh, there were lots of things that God used in that time in shaping my life. I remember doing a, a fascinating research project for three months in the Middle East, where I went out to do a... Uh, a survey of the industrial development in the Middle East and uh, I spent a year, a, a month at the Hebrew University and lots of other places but during this time there in the Middle East it was quite a stirring time for me about prayer I can still remember one incident where uh, I'd been for these two months already in, in Israel and uh, it was fascinating looking at early stages of solar development and lots of other sort of energy and early days they were of that, that. and uh, um, I had all these documents on it and I was trying to cross into Old Jerusalem, which was, of course, in Jordan. It was impossible in those days to be able to go across because if you had Israel stamped on your passport, you couldn't cross. And it was a long process, but eventually I managed to get a second passport and managed to cross. It was a really hassly experience getting across there, but I was determined to cross over because before ever I'd left, I'd met many years before a dear lady, old lady from Palestine. She was Palestinian, but she was blind. And she did this remarkable work among blind people. And I promised that if ever I visited, I'd go and see her. But of course, I hadn't realized then that you couldn't cross from Israel and Jordan. So now I'd managed to arrange it, but I'd not been able to communicate anything with her or tell her because you couldn't sort of contact between Israel and Jordan in those days. And so I just hoped I'd be able to find her uh, over in Jordan. And um, so eventually the day came when I crossed over. And I'd already been some months in the Middle East by now. And uh, I can still remember it was a really hassly day at the crossing point because I was the only one crossing it. They searched everything, even every hair on my toothbrush, crossing over. And uh, eventually I felt really exhausted. I thought, oh, I just find somewhere quiet. And I knew it. someone had told me about the garden tombs. I went to the garden tomb, which is in Jerusalem. It's this fascinating place where you see the old, where the, the stone which had been rolled away that kind of air in the in the cave there and uh, I just went inside this old this old wooden green gate I can still picture it now going inside and sat down with my bags as it were on this stone and I'd been there a little while thinking I better get ready to try and make my way down to Bethlehem where Auntie May that was this dear sister lived this blind sister she'd be so shocked to see me and I'd be so delighted to meet her but I hadn't been able to communicate so anyway I've only been sat there a few minutes when this creaky door this green door creaked open again and as the door creaked open, sort of steadily, I heard a voice say to a man who was a sort of gatekeeper there, is Brother Robert here? And I sort of stood up and turned towards the gate and uh, I said, uh, it might be me, my, my name's Robert. She said, you must be Brother Robert. And by now I could see that she was feeling a way in. This was an old lady that was blind and this was Auntie May. I said, Auntie May, how, how would you know I'd be here? Or I mean, today, or she said, oh, she said, today... This morning, she said, when I was talking with the Lord, he said to me, go today to the garden tomb at noon and you'll meet Brother Robert. Uh, the hairs went on the back of my neck and I, wow, you know, this sounds like New Testament stuff. I said, really? I said, yeah, yes. Yeah. She said, she told me, to, he told me to be here. And so she said, come with me. And so she took me back and I spent nearly a month with her. That was where I learned so much about prayer. Maybe because sometimes when you lose one faculty, like of sight, you develop an inner faculty of hearing, of listening to God. And for her, when you prayed, I used to pray with her every day. When she prayed, you'd look around as if the Lord must be there. So, you know, that sense of reality and intimacy and wonder in prayer. And it was one of those foundations God laying into my life about prayer. And as this journey went on, there were so many things that shaped my life. Eventually, as I say, I, I finished my postgraduate studies and things and... Uh, uh, I went to work for one of the largest companies in the world at that stage. It was a fascinating time. It was really heady days when lots of materials that are part of your, you'll have them as part of your clothes and part of this firm, today are part of our, our lives. But they were new discoveries in those days and many of the big countries were racing for them. At that stage we were racing with Czechoslovakia and Japan and we'd managed these amazing breakthroughs. And so I had, had appeared, God in his goodness, I mean, even though those patterns are in my name, I don't get anything for them to do in that you were in a company name. But I was, I came back to Bristol to write up some of these patterns. And so I was here for a time with lots of time to spare just writing these up and in those early mornings I would often go up to Blaze that's a lovely uh, estate area and I can still remember one morning that summer morning I was up there and I would read I was reading through the Acts of the Apostles my daily reading and I'd have a little green exercise book where I would journal some of my thoughts and keep a note of it and as I'm sat there reading I'm sat on this old bench that's just got a, a rung missing from it and I love Mabel carved on the other rung and uh, as I 
I'm sat there, and this, I'm looking out over this huge council housing estate, all these red tiled roofs. And as real as if someone was sat next to me, I sense that voice saying, who shall I send? Who will go for us? Ooh. Now, I, I, I'd read Isaiah 6, so I learned that sent to God's call, and I felt, oh, God. And, and I thought, but could it be that God's calling me? Could he be calling me to this estate? And I'm about to take up a new appointment, an international appointment. I was on a phenomenal salary, more than my father earned when he retired, and about to take up this new appointment. And I turned to the back of my exercise book, and I wrote down the options. Number one was a, I'd apply for a, a research that they were doing at Bristol and Bath in the area I, I was involved in. Another one was I'd retire early in five years' time and have enough then to be able to live on and, and come here. Or, and so it went down to I got to number 19. I was stretching the list. And number 19 was I'll resign from my work and come and apply for a council house and come and live on this council housing estate and work among these people. Well, you know, often what's last on our list yeah, it's first on God's list, and so it was. We were just not long married, had our first baby, and uh, I remember going back and saying to Pam that morning, Pam, I, I really feel God's been stirring me this morning. She said, I feel God's been stirring me as well. I said, oh, you tell me first. <laughs> and she said, well, I really feel God's been stirring us about what he wants to do with our lives. And I thought, I feel God's been stirring me as well. And so began a journey. It wasn't an easy one. I was on a, a secrecy, a high secrecy contract. It meant that, you know, because my employers, we just had these amazing breakthroughs and discoveries and things, and they were sure I was going, well, where are you going to work? And I said, well, I'm not really going to work anywhere else. Well, where are you going then? I, well, I, I, I'm going to church work, so you're going to seminary, not quite like that. Or where are you going to I'm going on this council housing estate. And they looked at me just unbelieving and just was sure I was going somewhere else. And so eventually there was a very senior personnel person in London who was a Christian, and I met with him and shared with him, and he believed me. And uh, so eventually I was released from my contract and after some months came and sure enough we came to live on that housing estate it took us two years and two months to visit every home or 10,000 of those homes and just plant church in that first housing estate and it was an amazing growing experience there's so many things we learned during that time but also God stirred our hearts not just for the estate but even in a sense for that wider world one of the things we did with some of our students was to invite students sometimes as teams to be part of that over their summer holidays and one of those teams came and um in fact, uh, one of them was a, uh, trained to be a doctor, and he was the son of a missionary from India. And I can remember his father was home on furlough when we were doing this outreach. He said, oh, would you like to come to India? And we run these discipleship training schools there and come for a few weeks and sort of, uh, you know, up for anything. It was the kingdom of God. And I said, oh, I'm sure I'd be wonderful. I thought, yeah, I, I, I'll certainly come. And I can remember um, committing to go to this. I even remember booking with the estate, with the travel agents, the, 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 the flight, as it were, to go. Now, life had been very simple for us. We lived of the gospel, literally everything. We'd given up everything to be able to come and, and, and work on this state. And um, so we just lived from week to week. And often it was a box of groceries or just some simple things for the baby and things like that. And life was fairly simple. But now suddenly I had a bill for several hundred pounds for this flight to India. And ooh. And I thought, but Lord, you, you, you stood in my heart to do this. And I was getting close to the time where I need to pay this bill. And I got to the day before and I need to pay it by the next day. And I'm getting desperate now in prayer. You know, it's like we're desperate in prayer, so I decide I'm going to spend a night in prayer and fasting. The trouble is that when you're desperate like that, it's kind of almost like trying to lay an egg, you know. You're, you're really you're struggling in prayer to, get, to answer the prayer. So here I am, and uh, we weren't at home. We were actually visiting at that stage Pam's mum. And so, uh, whereas normally I like to read prayer loud, I had to be a little bit quieter. And, and I got to the early hours of the morning. It was more perspiration than inspiration. I was really sweating trying to pray, but God, it's your work, and you've called me to do this, you know. And then suddenly that moment, like a revelation you know sometimes God brings a scripture alive to you those words of that scripture came delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart and I can remember it was like a revelation to me as if wow at first I thought oh how long do I need to delight in order to get the desire is it kind of thing you sort of like a little prelim you worship the Lord for a little while then you pray and get the answer to your prayers no 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 you delight in the Lord but you sure I get no you just delight in the Lord and he will give you desires of heart. And it's almost as if I began to see a different revelation that as you delight in the Lord, he gives you desires of heart. It's not that you've got your list of desires, then you delight him and then he gives you the list. But as you delight, he shapes those desires. And suddenly I felt released. It didn't even matter if I didn't get the money. It didn't matter if I didn't go to India. 
He said, oh, Lord, I want to do is delight in you and for you to shape those desires. And it's only a matter of a few minutes. I'm, I'm there, just it's the early hours of the morning by now, and I'm just worshipping the Lord, but just delighting in you. Now, rather than me struggling for God's God, just saying, Lord, you're the altogether lovely one, the fairest of 10,000, the bright and morning. Lord, you've raptured my heart. And those moments where you just delight in intimacy with God. And, and within a few moments, I felt as clear as that voice on the park bench. God said to me, in the post in the morning will be the answer to your prayers. I didn't even hardly stop to notice because by now I'm so taken up with delight in the Lord. It wasn't particularly, I hadn't even realized, of course, the post in the morning wouldn't be for me because I wasn't at home. I remember going downstairs in the morning and on the mat were three letters. It wasn't my home, so obviously the letters were to Mr. and Mrs., my in-laws, as it were. The first one to Mr., the second one to Mrs., but the third one was an airmail letter. And it was addressed to Rob Scott Cook at my in-laws. Wow, I'm opening this letter. Dear Rob, this will surprise you because you've not been in touch for so long. I've been working overseas. I'm in a closed country where there's no church to go to, so I've saved up my tithe. And I felt God really stirring me to send you this check. But I don't know where you're living now. I just remember when you were at university, you lived. So that's the only address I've got, so I'm sending it there and hoping it gets to you. And that check was for the exact amount for that airfare that day. But you see, it's that sense of when you experience something like that, you don't want to do it any other way. <laughs> I'd rather do that than have a million pounds in the bank, which I could buy a dozen air tickets. I want to sense a conscious dependence on God, a sense in which step by step he's unfolding his purposes in our lives. And that's why prayer is so key to all that we do. I must hasten. Goodness, that's just the introduction to the story. But here we are. So let me come to uh, church and vision. And uh, so it began our first housing estate and that visiting the housing estate. And when I came to that and found a church within those, after those two and a half years and seen that first church grow, we then went to the next housing estate and the next housing estate. And in those days, we, did, we planned them very much as independent local kind of churches and developed leadership for them. And eventually, I felt God stirring that we needed to be a much more sense in which we networked together. And so the next one we planted then was we took eight folks over to a little housing estate called Sea Mills. And uh, there was an old church building there that had been built. This was one of the earliest housing estates in Bristol, Sea Mills was. And uh, when they built it, they also built a church. And pre-war, it had thrived with all the new families being rehoused there. It thrived on a huge... When they did their Sunday school outing, they had a, a fleet of coaches that used to go there. But then during the war and post-war, it declined, 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 till eventually it had closed. It had been closed for 10 years now and was cobwebs everywhere. And someone had said to me, Rob, we know you're feeling stirred about these housing estates and seeing what's happening. He said, would you, would you be willing to, to look at this housing estate? So we, we brought eight folk along to just walk and prayer walk around. Prayer walking was new in those days, just a walk, prayer walk around the estate. And then we brought a little team of students as well and did our outreach into that housing estate. I can still remember now two of those students eventually became part of that first plant. We married them. They were the first marriage that had happened in that church for nearly, uh, I suppose, 70 years. And... Uh, Another couple, in fact, one was tra trained to be a Methodist minister up at the old Wesley College, and the other was a nurse. They met together, literally, we put them together out on the doors. They got married. In fact, they're still part of High Grove now. Since then, they've been around the world in missionary work and working in some of the famine relief. But these were really heady days, and from that small group, we converted the back into a flat, and that was where we had our first home group, just that embryo group, and it grew. Every year, it doubled in its next year, and then, because it wasn't too far from the halls of residence with the students, Students, we began to strengthen that work with the students and it was wonderful to see God do it and uh, I can still remember one year it was the beginning just like this would be with Freshers Week next to starting now this week and uh, so I'd been up to visit the halls of residence up in Stoke Bishop and uh, I prayed particularly Lord just even if it was just one student just for me to reach the right one. And I can still remember there at Wills Hall, I met a group of students, and one of them was a first year student, just arrived, and I said hi to him. Do you know what his name was? Philip Gennardo. There we are. First day. And so we shared together, prayed together. He shared. He'd been involved in youth evangelism mission in his heart. And I think he felt God join our hearts together. There's something you know, particularly in planting and church growth, to be able to I sense how you identify those who God is stirring into leadership and developing intentionally that discipleship and growth. And so over those three years at university, it was a great experience of mentoring and, uh, with Philip and seeing that. And then he went for seven years involved in Youth for Christ and that mission. Then we gave him a little break to be able to, like Abraham's servant, to go and find a wife, which he did over to Cobham and came back with this 
wonderful wife, Kate. And, uh, and so that was part of that story. And during that, other students, there was another student who, earlier than this, there was one of them called Dave Mitchell. I can just remember him with long haired hippie at the time. And uh, with his, started his earring. Then he had a few more of them, I think, even coming with a nose ring then. But anyway, um, and, uh, and then another one called Tim Dobson. And so part of that developing those leadership and as High Groove grew we then planted out because it was packed to the doors and we were already then at full house and had a big impact into that community and so we, pa we planted into the, the neighbouring area which was Henley's and Westbury and we started in a small group we had a home group in Henley's and so we met in Henley's school at first it was the primary school I can still remember the, the seats about so high and so we decided we felt we prayed for a, a building and uh, the bank on Henley's road came up for sale we didn't get it we didn't feel it was the right one for us but then eventually the old Westbury Primary School, which is now Adult Education Centre, was up for auction. And we really felt this would be ideal. It had an assembly room and classes and everything else. But eventually we weren't able to get to the auction. I prayed so desperately, Lord, whatever happens. And sure enough, it didn't go at the auction. But the next day we made an offer. I tell you, you wouldn't be able to buy a lock-up garage now for what we bought it for. And so we bought it and that became our next one. And so that began to grow and develop. Because it was on the border of Henleys and Westbury, it gave a chance of touching both those communities. And again as that grew and every year one of the wonderful things you know from those very first days every year every year over these 30 odd years much more than that now every year we've seen church grow and to see always that significant of new life in Jesus constantly seeing unchurched people coming to faith in Jesus and part of the life and worship of the church so we doubled the services then. We had two services on a Sunday morning, and Lee's, and then as it grew further, we were trying to see how we, one of the, the things I was trying to do now was rather than just plan a separate church and then go on and plant another one, how do we network them together? How do we grow together? So what we were doing then was we began to meet in the mornings in Sea Mills, and in Henley's Westbury, and then in the evening we came together. But we did it first by alternating venues, and that was always a bit disruptive as to where you... So we then looked at a central venue, and we found a, a hotel that the university had taken over called Hawthorns up in Woodlands Road, up by the uh, grammar school there. And so we met in the refectory there for a Sunday evening for a while. And one Sunday, as I'm passing by, I see this big for sale sign up outside this old church building. Now, I'd passed it many times, because I was, remember, an undergraduate at Bristol, and used to pass it on every day and it was then the BBC prop store because they were doing live production to the BBC and so they'd set it up as a warehouse and put a big hole in the door you know barn doors with the, the loading bay etc and so it was for sale I contacted the agent and it had been for sale for some time though I'd not seen it before and uh, the agent said yes we've already got a lot of interest in it he said are you, are you interested yourself I said yeah we'd really be interested in it and you know it's this great big barn of a place and uh, so he said fine do you, do you want to make an offer I said yeah we'd love to make an offer he said so so I made an offer he chuckled a little and said are you serious I said yeah he said I'm afraid we've already got some multi-million pound offers on it because one of them is going to turn it into a leisure centre sports centre in the middle for the Clifton clientele etc and uh, he said uh, unless you can come with something higher than that I'm afraid I said well could I have a look at it he said I don't think we'd even arrange that really because it's not worth it really for what we're doing and so we weren't able to see it I just had the estate agent's details you know like for a house with a photograph on it and how many square feet it was etc and but I put those details in my little prayer I have a prayer folder I use every day and I have it often maybe photographs of missionaries or prayer letters and things and, and every day I pray through it and so I, I kept in it you think well, it was a bit late now Rob it's all gone and so true enough and the next day and I think well is it any point still but I remember each day I pray over it lay my hands on it a week went by a month went by three months went by it was now into the summer. It was sweaty hands. The building had a halo over it where I'd laid my hands on it every day. And, and, and so it came to nine months later. It's a, and, and as I'm praying over it this Sunday morning, I'm laying my hands on it in prayer. I felt God say, now's the time. Ooh, it's a Sunday. First thing on the Monday, I phoned the estate agent. And I said, you most likely won't remember me. He said, I think I do. He said, you're the chap that showed that into the building. I said, yeah. And then he said this, I, I wasn't sharp enough for you. He said, who's been talking to you? He said, no, I'm sure I could have had a sharp answer really, didn't I? but there we are, I didn't. But, and I said, why did you say that? He says, well, the amazing thing is for months, they've been trying to get this planning permission to turn it into a leisure center, but it's a listed building and they just, it's all fallen through now. He said, I haven't even yet met with my team this morning, so they don't even know yet that it's up for sale again. I'm about to meet with them, and you, you've just phoned me. I said, well, that's wonderful, I said, because you can't refuse now, can you? And he said, he said well, have you got another offer? I said, no, still the same offer. <laughs> So he arranged me to get the keys and I went along to the BBC, their little 
lodge with place there and got the keys and went in for the first time and had a look around. It was all, I mean, it was a, a mixture of things because it had been a prop store where they'd racked it out as a, as a warehouse for toilet seats and mattresses on right the way up to the roof. You go right to that top roof and see the top shelves there, which I think were light bulbs. And, uh, you know, right the way through, it was all empty now and um, children in need had used it for some of their filming by the BBC. There was no power on, there were rats running around and it was just derelict and... So I, I took the keys back to the BBC. I said, Could I, do you think I'd come again? Oh, yeah, there's no one else at the moment seeing it. And so I went back again. Eventually he said to me, you can have them for a couple of days now. So I remember spending that night and I was in their prayers. It's pitch dark now. I, but as I'm praying, I have this picture and this glimpse and the place is full of light and full of people. I'm standing on the what's now is the stage by that pillar on the left-hand side. And as I'm looking at I can see it full of people. And do you know there's something about when Scripture says you ask and God will answer above all that you could ask or imagine Sometimes we just don't imagine, and therefore we, we don't really focus that praying. But I imagine, as I did, I prayed, Lord, I'm praying now to release that purpose, for this to become, again, a place of worship, a place of praise that's filled with your praises. Well, I'll cut the story short. We went back, and so we went those negotiations back and forth with the, with, the, with the agents, the BBC. By now, I think the BBC were already keen to get rid of it. They already had a storm and some storm damage on the roof and a lot of other problems around it. I took a group of our leaders to be able to go and have a look at it. And they stood in that road, in Woodlands Road, looked up and said, Rob, whoo, that's a big building, Rob. That's a big liability. But what an amazing opportunity, I said. And uh, eventually we persuaded folk that it would be worth taking the risk missing slates and all and, and size and so in God's goodness we bought it we bought it for less than you pay for a house today um, we insure it now for 15 million but there we are but uh, it's, it's, ama- it's an amazing story one of the challenges was to be able to get it registered as a church again even the church commissioners it could have been almost anything it could be stored but anyway eventually did and, and so Woody's began at first we weren't going to use it we, we were just going to use it for a Sunday evening gatherings together which we did do but then we quickly sensed we want to use it also as a next church plant and so we planted then into Woody. And so that story of of growth and planting went on and all this time also was a great stirring for the city and how we resource things in the city. Already I've been feeling that stirring uh, with regard to the the poor and the needy and the marginalized and how as a city also we were reaching out to them. And and this is, if I go right back even to that early stirring, right back now I'm saying this was the refugee crisis of the boat people back in 78, 79. It was a huge crisis, even bigger than the migration crisis currently. In those days, there were so many children's bodies on the beaches of the China Sea, but there were no mobile phones or social media to be able to send them around the world. It was a huge tragedy of thousands and thousands that died of those boat people. And I can still remember, sat with our two children, they were just young children at tea, when it first came on the news. And we were sat having tea and our children, as they saw those pictures of those young children crying on those boats and so desperate, and I can still remember saying, Dad, we've got to help them. And I said, I'm sure it would be great to be able to do that. You know, the trouble is as adults, we get that kind of armchair detachment, whereas for children is that wonderful, almost naive sense. And so they, they hadn't finished their, I don't know, fish fingers and chips. They said, Dad, we, we, could, we could give some of these to them. And I said, it's a long way to send them, and they'll be a bit stale by the time they get there. Well, we could invite them to come and have tea with us then. Yeah, but it's a long way to come, and it's not quite as easy as all that. And even to be able to get here, the government has got to allow them to be able to come in at the moment. The government's not got any plans of doing that. Say, well, but dad, you could write to the prime minister and be able to do it. And, but you know, they were persistent, really persistent. When we went to bed that night and said our prayers, the first prayer, they said, oh God, help dad as he writes to the prime minister tonight. And I, as I said, amen, I knew I was committed now. So I wrote to the prime minister. I wrote two letters, one to the prime minister, one for the foreign secretary, not quite sure whether it wanted to end down the street near the parliament, etc. They wanted to know, because in the morning, the first thing when they woke up, where were the letters? They wanted to post them on the way to school. And so they did. I'd fulfilled it. <laughs> a few weeks later, later, a letter came back. Very official letter from 10 Downing Street. Thank you, Mr. Scott Cook, for your letter. Um, we've noticed your interest, etc. At the moment, the UK government has no plans to be receiving any of the Vietnamese refugees. But we will let you know if that policy practice changes. Well, there was a certain lady with a handbag who was in government at that stage, and she went out to Hong Kong, and when she came back, she'd agreed to take 10,000 of the refugees. And I had a letter a few months later 
The children every night had prayed for those refugees. Dear Mrs. Scott Cook, the government has now agreed to take the first of the refugees, and as yours was the first letter that came to us, so we now need to find local groups of people who will be willing to form resettlement groups to take them. And so we took here in Bristol the first of those. I can still remember the coach arriving with their just black bags and our children having saved up their pocket money to help them. We then set up the first resettlement group, which was the, re the Vietnamese resettlement group for what was then known as Avon, so that it was a much bigger area than just Bristol, as it were. I still remember the first thing. We, in fact, settled the first ones at Southmead. They had bricks with the window and the clothes taken off the line, all the other things of helping to resettle and to handle some of the challenges it was. But at that time, God stood in our hearts prophetically also that God would make this city a city of refuge. That was a prophetic word. And that prophetic word stirred so much in the city. From that word came so many mercy ministries, the 125 project, remember seeing that begin, the crisis center ministries, network, all those began out of that kind of prophetic word about being a city of refuge and stirring. And so in that wider context of cities that grew, it was great to see Woody's continuing now to grow. And at each stage, there were new challenges. Every year it grew, every year. And... Uh, then, I suppose I ought to rush up to date, but, you know, lots of things along that journey and uh, other situations around the city. We've networked, so our vision, my vision stirred right back in those early days in 1980 was of seeing a network of churches, 100 live churches, each with a commitment to reach 10,000 people. That's a million people, which was Avon. God had stood in my heart, what would you do if you'd reach the population of the whole world? I'd never even thought that big before. And I thought 5,000 strategic centers, each reaching a million people. That would be Tokyo and Mexico City. No, Bristol, one million people in Avon. Wow, how would I reach that one million people? Well, just 100 communities of 10,000 makes you a million. 10,000 is the normal size of an average ward here. And so we began. That was all those years ago. We're, we're well over halfway, nearly three quarters of the way there. We're 86 of those communities now. We, we see. So we're looking to see from all sorts of different contexts, churches, whatever their background and denomination, but with a commitment to reach their local community, a light in every street, every home, every family being reached with the good news of the Lord Jesus. And so that constant vision of multiplying. So even in this last year, it's been fascinating to see that grow, and you've been part of that. So for Woodlands Group of Churches, in this last year, our vision, uh, maybe about 18 months, two years ago, was that we plant again into one of our housing estate areas. That would be the branch, which would be a plant from community church into Brentry. No church in Brentry of any kind, not even a parish church. The old parish church closed. It's covered now by a neighboring parish, but not, not any church at all in that housing estate, with a whole new area being built at Filton. And then the second one was that we would plant into the city centre, Woodlands Metro. An opportunity because the city itself was changing. In recent years, it's developed a whole residential community. The whole thing with the students that are here, here. Never, that's all relatively new and a whole dimension of that. Also a whole residential. But the chance, too, to be able to reach young adults and the whole business community in a sense of a, a whole dimension of of in the city seeing a presence that is constantly developing a church which is easy to access, easy to bring friends to, but not just bring them once and never come again. But once they come, they just can't help coming again. How do we cultivate a culture of that infectious discipleship? And so that's been our vision. Metro is part of that vision. And for this coming year, we feel quite a stirring. It's wonderful to see things get underway last year, and so many of you with hard work and laying those foundations. But I feel very much a sense that this is just the beginnings. And not only are we looking, we're looking every year for that incremental growth across the city. So we have kind of clear goals we have pressing towards that goal every year. I look to see, I pray every day, sensing that new life in Jesus. And so here, I'm looking not just, I'm looking for literally exponential growth. I feel there are going to be some wow factors over this next year. I feel even one of them now with the whole student ministry, and it's great to have Matt as part of it. It's a whole new dimension to have a presence of students in the city centre here, but a new opportunity. And what I'm looking for is not just students to find church. I want to shape their lives. I want to find my Philip Gennados who will be arriving this year on their first day next week. Imagine that. And they'll be part of that next generation. And how do we inspire them? So I look, as I say, whether it's been a Dave Mitchell or Tim, I can still remember them as students here. How do we take those and nurture a vision for church planting and growth. Because in this city, we have a window of opportunity like no other generation history has had. 
There's a sense of unity among the churches like has never, ever been in the history of this city. A working together, a vision together. You know, uh, in December, this, this December, come, we'll bring together 120 leaders, key leaders from other cities. They'll include all the main leaders, the Bishop of Bristol, the Bishop of Clifton, the, the main leader of the Anglican the Methodists, the leaders of the Salvation Army, etc. We'll bring together a number of business leaders and others together. We'll bring the mayor together. And we'll have an evening where we share together. We give thanks to God for all that he's done over this past year. We break bread together. And we pray into this coming year. And we do it together, right the way across the churches, to sense how we impact this city for God. Already we felt stirring. We were a, when the new mayor was just elected, it was wonderful within just a brief time being elected to be able a chance to meet with him. I think it was my latest, we met at 10 o'clock that night and um, I think Ed was there as well. And, and, and as we met together, it was great to have a chance to pray with him and to hear him say the first thing he wanted to do as mayor was to invite the Holy Spirit into this city to bring an impact and influence in this city. And I do fear we have an opportunity like we've never had in history. And the word we're sensing for the city, and we shared there with the mayor and those leaders together over these past months, is that God's saying this will be a city, a city of hope, a city of hope. A city of hope for people who've been hopeless and marginalized and lost. For young people who've never had aspirations during hope. But above all, also that spiritual dimension when the Bible describes a world around us, it's without God. To be without God is to be without hope. How do you bring that message of hope? How do we do it with an infectious discipleship? How do we do it with every one of us, every day, everywhere, just naturally, supernaturally sharing our faith? How is there a sense in which it's not just that I wake up today and think, well, I'm pressing towards the goal. It's my life goal. It's whole life discipleship. This is what I'm committed to in my personal life and our life together. To press towards that goal to reproduce the life of Jesus. Father, I pray now that you would come by your spirit. And Lord, as we start this new season at Metro, we pray, Lord, there'll be a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit, a fresh outpouring of your spirit here into the city center, Lord, that will affect this city, that it will become increasing a city of hope. We pray, Lord, for the work with the students and Matt and the team coming up. We pray, Lord, for this year increasingly for that exponential growth, Lord. Come, come, Holy Spirit. Grant that growth, we pray. We can plant, Lord, we can water but you alone can give the increase. Come, come by your spirit and release your purpose among us, we pray in Jesus' name.